accumulate more of it, and they're not really very, very, very good in, in, in fixing that damage by 24 hours. If we put wild type P10, so we reconstitute in this exact same type, it's a cell type, when this is not possible to do in, in, in patients, if we put this P10 back into these, they become actually proficient in fixing this damage. So damage occurs, damage occurs at half an hour, those are the red dots, the green actually is the P10 protein in vivo in cells, and then those, those dots are pretty much res resolved by 24 hours. So by putting P10 back in, we have actually allowed these cells to fix their DNA after exposure, uh, exposure to, to a DNA damaging agent, in this case irradiation. But if we put a mutation in P10 that no longer goes to the nucleus, this actually fails. So you will see that the P10 protein here, the P10 protein here is restricted largely to the, to the cytoplasm. And if we don't put P10 back in the nucleus, they won't be able to fix their DNA, their, their, their damaged DNA. So this is also reproduced by a, another half a dozen assays, so we, that gives us the confidence that we're actually looking at something that is real. And then cutting straight to sort of the end of the study, we've actually built um, a sort of a new network as to where P10 participates or where P10, with P10 works. And that is not only in making decisions as part of this PI3 kinase pathway that I, de that I described before, which is sort of in this area, but it's also participating in very important decisions in exposure to, 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 to DNA damage. Um, and this is what actually happens in both cells as well as mice, and we've shown it in mice. We've also shown it in uh, multiple human cell lines where we're able to put P10 back in. And that is that in the absence of P10, you have, there's a defect that is not only in the P3 kinase side of things, but also in this DNA damage side of things. And this basically drives the realization, or if you will, the conclusion that, that P10 deficient cells or P10 deficient tumors, in our case because that's what we're thinking about, may be sensitive to P3 kinase inhibitors only if presented in the context of DNA damaging agents. So we've done these experiments in mice, we've done them in um, tumors that we take out of patients and grow them inside mice. We've also done these experiments in mouse models of cancer, but have, we have not done them in patients. And there's one of the, the biggest obstacles is that the combination of these two agents is extremely, extremely toxic. So we're really looking at ways of reducing the levels of both agents to be able to combine them and offer some hope for people who have, who have cancers that are, that are featuring P10 loss. This is my last slide, and um, uh, this is something that I'm sort of adding here. Um, even though the work is, is fully in progress, we are going back to the sort of decorations on P10, if you will. We're obsessing now. We, we continuously obsess over these things and spend years of studying single individual um, modifications. We found another point of, of, of modification that sits within the phosphatase domain that we think is incredibly important in directing this DNA damage response. We may be even more important than these other ones that we, we discovered before. And the other thing is, and this was this came up a, a, a little bit when the gentleman uh, asked about his uh, eight, eight year old believed believe son. We've actually, um, in only specific cell types, been able to identify interaction between P10 and the Duchenne muscular dystrophy complex. Now, no one has ever looked at this before, and we have not, we were not looking for Duchenne muscular dystrophy complex at all, but the way that our research is set up is that we're trying to be genome-wide and, com and comprehensive, that we could not ignore the fact that in the cell type in which we performed the screen, this, this started to come up. So there I have a couple of people in my lab that are, that are working very hard in trying to understand the connection between the two. And is it in fact that P10 may be contributing in the Duchenne sort of space, or are these Duchenne proteins possibly working in the P10 space? Or is it one in the same space? So these are the things that we're, we're, we're very interested in now. So this is the group of people that did most of the work. Um, what I spoke about quite a bit was uh, a work from Christian Bassi, who is a graduate student. Obviously the people from uh, 1998, I don't have a picture of, of them, and, and that was actually my lab work at, at, at the time. And then there's a couple of new people and our funders on, on this side. I'd be happy to take questions. No? Good. Right?
So, thank you. Hey y'all, we're about to break for, we're gonna have a, uh, where everybody grabs their lunch and then bring it back to your seat. If you have a child in the childcare room, please take care of their lunch. However, we're gonna start two different video greetings. So you can watch it for a moment and then grab your lunch or watch it while you're grabbing your lunch and they will be back to back. And then Dr. Uh, Carol Burke will speak um, here shortly. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Hi, my name is Jennifer Hall and this is Preston and we are here for the P10 uh, Patient Symposium and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about... Would everyone please stand on their head? <laughs> <laughs> Close. Close. That's the one that said B BCL. Hi, my name is Jennifer Hall and this is Preston and we are here for the P10 uh, Patient Symposium and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Preston's journey and our trial um, at Boston Children's that we were that Preston just completed in February. Preston is 10 years old and he's a twin. They were both born at 30 weeks and spent time in the NICU and some of our first um, things that we found with Preston was we found that he had a cranial facial disorder. So when he was about six, seven weeks old, they discovered this and we knew that he would be having a big skull revision surgery when he was, right before his first birthday, around um, 10 months of age. So he had that and we knew that we were experiencing some delays along the way. Um, and his cranial facial surgeons and neurosurgeons felt like he must have something other than a cranial facial disorder. They thought maybe he had an unidentified cranial facial syndrome. So they kept kind of digging for answers as we were having issues with failure to thrive, respiratory issues, GI issues, um, and just kind of not finding, he wasn't quite fitting into just a single fused suture uh, patient. So when he was about six years old, we discovered that he had P10. And then that kind of took us on a journey and we ended up at Boston Children's um, this summer to transfer his care. We we're, were from the Dallas area and he had his cranial facial um, surgery in Dallas and most of his team was in Dallas with a few doctors in Fort Worth. But we ended up at Boston um, and met um, the people there and decided that we would do the trial that was just, just then starting. So Preston enrolled in the trial in July and got started and we pretty much within about two weeks, or it was about four weeks of starting, but we had suspicions that he was possibly um, on the drug and not the placebo. Uh, we saw differences in his communication and just like it's interactions that we were having. And then we started <laughs> experiencing some just gross motor changes. And what do you like to play? What was your the thing you like to play a lot outside? iPad. Baseball! <laughs> he likes to hit the baseball. And we started seeing him being able to make contact with the bat. And he was playing outside and just having lots of fun. <laughs> Preston is a really happy kid. And he loved going to Boston, even though it was a bit of a journey for us and we had a lot of traveling over the last six months. It was such a great experience and we got to meet a lot of the people on the research team and we were just really thankful to be a part of it. And Preston did a great job and we did find out in, at the end of the trial that he was actually on the drug and he really um, did well and we think we saw um, some, some significant improvements and we've seen them continue in the month that he's been off now of the drug. So we're thankful to be here and Preston is um, a joy and we love him <laughs> and he loves life. So thanks so much. No.
Well, it's awesome. Okay. And if Preston's here, I'd take those kisses. Where is he? <laughs> Good day, everyone, and a warm thank to Christine, the foundation, and the organizers for the opportunity to be with you, albeit briefly and albeit uh, in spirit. You know, I'm uh, very sorry I couldn't be there uh, in person. Uh, I am here in Boston uh, to give a few remarks, but unfortunately, when you will gather for this exciting symposium, I will be abroad. Nevertheless, I'm extremely grateful uh, for the opportunity to be able to share with you my enthusiasm for this exciting and transformative phase uh, uh, in P10 research. As some of you might know, uh, I've been working on P10 for almost 20 years, since 1997 when the gene was identified, but I've never been so excited for what we are experiencing now for this transformative phase, I would say revolutionary phase in P10 research. And this is due to two very simple and very specific uh, reasons. The first uh, is that in the last 20 years we have been able to learn quite a great deal on how P10 is uh, regulated, how the function of P10 is regulated. And this new knowledge in turn has allowed us to find pharmacological ways to reactivate, to resurrect, to an P10 function. And this is extremely important for cancer patients, but is also very, very important for individuals which are affected by P10 hamartomas tumor syndrome. Now, the second reason why we are so excited is due and rest on our ability to sequence our book of life, our genome, from the first to the last letter, from the first to the last book. And this, in turn, will allow us to understand better why P10 hamartomas tumor syndrome display different penetrants, what are the genetic modifiers, what are the other additional cancer susceptibility gene out there, which very likely will be direct uh, modifiers of P10 itself. So while this new knowledge will impact uh, and will allow us to understand more on P10 amartomas tumor stream, what is really exciting and transformative is the knowledge we have already today is transformative. This knowledge is in fact allowing us to do what uh, seemed to be a dream only a few years ago, which is to reactivate, to resurrect uh, P10 for cancer prevention and therapy. So we are living in very exciting times. I hope you will tremendously enjoy this meeting and the discussion, and uh, I hope to see you soon in person at the next meeting.